Hello, everybody. Really great to see you all. Um, I'm not going to lie. I, I'm sitting here. We haven't done one of these in a couple months and my heart is pounding. I'm actually really nervous for this one, which is funny because I'm typically not nervous for them. I don't know if it's the new year or we haven't done it, but uh, it's exciting to see all your faces. I'm, I'm intentionally leaving no screen share up at the minute because I want everybody to look at everybody else's faces and folks who can turn, you know, turn on their video. Uh, we're going to talk about it in a minute, but this is not a webinar, right? We're not like here to pitch this thing. Although there's going to be a bunch of slides. We're going to be talking about you a lot. This is a community and all of you are part of this. And um, I'm really excited to see the growth in it this year. And what we're going to spend the first 10 minutes or so talking about is what we saw in 2021 before we get into the state of FinOps in 2022. So let's kick off. Can you see my screen? February 10th. Brilliant. So this is the first FinOps Summit of the year. Uh, we typically do one of these a month. Uh, we're going to take a few off this year. I think we're taking August off. We're taking a, a, a tip from our, our European friends that August is not a great month to do work. Uh, but for the most part, you'll be able to join us every month this year for one of these. For those of you who are new to us, uh, the FinOps Foundation is a Linux Foundation program. And we're all about the people who do FinOps, which is why I put all your faces up there. We're here to advance you and your careers as you practice this discipline. If you want to check out FinOps.org, we recently updated the air quotes official definition of FinOps. And I'm saying air quotes because it is evolving all the time. We've already gotten feedback. This needs to go further, but this is the definition that's on the website right now. Please submit uh, additional thoughts around it. One of the things we clarified as part of this definition update is that FinOps is a portmanteau for dev, uh, sorry, for fin, finance, fin and DevOps working together in a collaborative fashion. It is not shorthand for cloud financial operations. This is one of the community feedback points we've gotten, and you'll see as this definition evolves, more of that data will go there. I want to introduce our uh, friend Joe Daly, who's our head of community, to talk about some of the things that have been happening in contribution land. Hey, folks. Uh, just like JR said, this is not a webinar. You know it's not a webinar because we can all see each other on the camera. <laughs> um, and we are an open source community. Uh, that means you make the content. If you are not contributing and making the content, we our, our summits are just us staring at you for an hour and a half. Um, I, so look at all the names here on this slide, folks who have been participating in working groups. I want to call out uh, Vittorio Barres uh, down there at the bottom. Uh, he can like out of the blue contributed an updated definition about uh, operating or managing committed use discounts. Um, he submitted it via GitHub. Uh, and it's it's getting approved and accepted and, and um, immediately put it into the framework. Fantastic. Thank you, Vittorio. Uh, you don't have to be GitHub literate. There's also a button that says make a suggestion. I don't know how to use GitHub. We call, we call it the Joe button, actually. Yeah, I, like I demanded this button exists for us finance people. Uh, so go in there, update. We are an open source community. We need you. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, looking forward to highlighting more of the contribution. So here's our mission. Our mission is to advance all of you. And there's three things on here that are really important. You're going to hear us hit over and over and over throughout the year. We have three objectives, three objective groups, and all of our working groups are going to go through this. The first is to create community. So Joe, for example, is leading a big effort to get more meetups and ambassadors, and that's one of the community areas. Uh, the next is to advance careers. Uh, Stacy, who you heard from the beginning, is leading a talent development initiative to not only do education and training, but also help with career ladders and salary guides and, and bringing more people into this discipline because there's more jobs than there are expert practitioners. And the third is about defining standards, which you're going to hear from Vaz later and a bunch of the TAC and governing board. How do we build open source best practices, standards, frameworks, et cetera? Everything we do is going to be through the lens of those three areas. As a Linux Foundation program, we have this basic structure. The center of us is the practitioner community. All of you, we're all here to support you. Me and my team work for the governing board, which you're going to meet here in a minute as well. They control the budget and funds, drive direction, but all the standards and best practices, the technical bits, are actually a group called the Technical Advisory Council. It's a completely different nonprofit that I, or most none of the staff, anything with the money, have any votes on that defines working groups, best practices, and the standards as they go. So there's lots of different areas for you to get involved with, depending on your level of interest here. The FinOps community this year has gotten uh, pretty big. I'm going to do a year in review here shortly, uh, but we've got a ton of great uh, practitioners around the world and vendors who have plugged in. I want to give a thank you to our premier vendor members 
uh, Cloud Health, Google Cloud, SADA, Deloitte, Accenture, Vertisent, Aptio Cloudability, McKinsey and Company, NordCloud, Software One, Tencent, and our newest, which you're going to meet shortly here, a little company called Apple. Uh, and to the other, I think, four dozen uh, general members uh, who support and make the practitioner community uh, able to do the work they do. Thank you for your support of this. So let's talk about what happened in 2021. Uh, my super formal marketing title for this section is the year that FinOps got real. Uh, I, would, I would summarize this whole thing by saying in 2019, when I went to conferences, people would say, FinOps, what is that? And in 2021, I'd find people say, oh yeah, I totally get what that is. Now tell me how to do it better. This is the most interesting graph we saw this last year. The number of people on LinkedIn listing FinOps as a skill or part of their job title literally is going up and to the right at an angle that I don't see many graphs doing. This is an exciting inflection point and we're seeing more and more jobs being posted. And interestingly, it's really a candidate's market. So great place for all of you to be here. Uh, we see almost every company in the space from the Global 2000 doing FinOps to the vendors to the clouds hiring aggressively for these roles. From the survey data that we're gonna review, we found that the majority of the practitioner community, 70 plus percent was from large enterprises, uh, 1K plus, uh, 10K plus, 100K plus up. Uh, these companies and individuals are spread all over the globe. Uh, pretty even distribution, interestingly, between North America uh, and EMEA, uh, smaller APAC representation, but growing quickly with Tencent joining, they're pushing heavily into China. Uh, you know, we were just taught, hearing from Tiago about uh, South America and what's happening there in Brazil. I think we'll see those grow. And the third data point here is we have a big range of people involved from contributors all the way up to C-level folks uh, who are doing FinOps at different levels. The survey also found that FinOps is now in pretty much every major industry. So the two clear leaders, uh, not super surprising, were financial services, huge contingent. I think we've got over 170 banks and financial services companies in the foundation now, and information technology companies were the, were the most respondents to the survey. Uh, however, if you look at the, the orange bar there, which is on the left, the total and on the right is blown out to industry, everything is represented. Healthcare, media, retail, telecom, manufacturing, oil and gas, it's all across the board. So this has become a ubiquitous practice in 2021, which is pretty exciting to see. We're also seeing a big range of cloud strategies being represented. And in particular, what I thought was interesting was the increase in number of public cloud first and also a pretty reasonable, I mean, 25% who are all in public cloud or born in public cloud now. Uh, public cloud use, but hybrid is a big chunk, but we're seeing that mode go to, we wanna go all in public cloud, but we're still moving to hybrid over time. The FinOps Foundation itself, um, where, where we work, Saw great growth last year too. It, it actually mirrors, I think, what we've seen in the industry uh, about four to five X for all the numbers uh, last year to this year, uh, which we've seen in terms of growth of media mentions and analysts. You know, we now have over 5,000 practitioner members, those practicing this who are not vendors, not consultants in the community. Uh, we started last year with only 200 people certified. We ended the year with uh, almost 1,600. Uh, and in December alone, uh, almost 250 people registered for certification. So those certifications are starting to really climb quickly. Uh, the Slack community, if you're not in there, please get in there. There's uh, now over 2,500 of you who are actively contributing, having conversations, having discussions. And then all those great premier vendor members we saw joined. Uh, and probably most exciting is a bunch of new training materials rolling out uh, in last year. We had the practitioner course, the engineering course has come out and the pro course as well. This is the meat of what you want to look at, though. If you go to FinOps.org, the community really rallied last year to start building content. They're fleshing out the FinOps framework, again, contribute to that. There's a whole bunch of projects that launched white papers, virtual playbooks on how to, I don't know, get engineers to take action, how to do forecasting, how to deal with shared costs, all these common problems. Those all launched in 21. We're seeing those continue to iterate and grow. Uh, the FinOps Foundation itself, uh, my, my, my favorite group of people, I think, who I get to work with every day, uh, in November 2020, it was just Stacy and I uh, who joined as employees of the Linux Foundation. In 21, we brought in all these great folks uh, who really started to build out the community, build out the foundation. Uh, and then in 22, we've already added three new people who are all deep SMEs, experts, FinOps practitioners, we're gonna hear about them later, who have built FinOps practices at Fortune 100s or FTSE 100 companies to help support this community. Same thing with the FinOps board. Uh, in the beginning of 20, uh, 21 into 2020, it was myself, Jennifer Hayes, Mike Fuller, and Deb from Cloud Health. So that's Fidelity, Lassie, and Cloud Health. Uh, original board member was Rachel Dines. If she's around, she was a, one of our emeritus board members. 
But in 21, we saw a huge explosion of new companies joining. Uh, most of the major vendors in the space joined the board. Uh, some of the biggest, uh, you know, and most advanced practitioner companies like HSBC and uh, you know Chevron joined as well. Uh, and in 22, we've already seen a bunch of great new board members come, uh, both as premier members and as practitioners, Tencent, Software One, and Apple. So this is the brain trust that's driving strategy behind this group to support this community. Now, we're doing something new on this uh, time. First, as, as with most of our things, this is an experiment. We'll see how it works. I'm going to stop my screen share here for a second. And we have uh, a lovely lady named Renata, who I'm trying to find in the, in the list here, who is doing live graphic recordings of what we're talking about. Let's see if we can find her here. Renata, I'm going to spotlight you and hopefully we've got boom. So if you want to watch behind the scenes as we go through this, Renata is doing live graph recording of what we're talking about. Uh, she has not really seen the slides. This was not really pre planned. We had a 30 minute prep call, but she's creating content for us behind the scenes. It's going to uh, really help tell the story. Thanks, Renata. Do you want to say anything while I've got you here? Nope. More with the words. I'm good. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So watch Renata on your own if you want in the practitioner list. Her name is spelled R-E-N-A-T-T-A, -T -T and we'll come back to her a few times during uh, the session here. And hopefully this works when I unspotlight her. Can you now see my slides instead of her? Great. Boom. So let's talk about some community highlights. Back to you, Joe. All right. So the next month, uh, our next summit, I'll give a much larger community update about all everything we're planning for the new year, uh, something for everyone. Um, but right now, I want to spotlight uh, Jenna and Benjamin uh, for putting up video introductions of themselves in the intro channel. Look, folks, it, it's 2019 was the last time I saw most of you or uh, some of you pre-pan. Uh, so I am looking for engagement this year. I want to see you as human beings. Uh, go out there. I don't care if you've already introduced yourself. Make a video. Say hello. We've got to build this community up and get those connections going. Uh, so Benjamin's in Belgium. He did it. Jenna's in San Francisco Bay Area. She did it. Uh, you know, doesn't have to be professional. It can be really short. It can be a little long. Don't not too long. Uh, put it up there in the intros channel. Say hello. Yeah, and as I, as I said right at the beginning, for those who just joined, uh, I'm literally nervous right now. This is a big group. We haven't had one this big before. It's okay to do video and say you're nervous or mess up your stuff. Uh, one of the things I decided this last year, because we do a lot of video work, is I don't edit anything. If we flub, we flub. We put it in. It's fine. Just post it out there. Everybody's at home on Zoom. It's cool. So thanks to those who are starting to do that. All right, so we have four new uh, vendor members who've joined as well. We do give them a 30-second bit here to introduce themselves. I'm going to remind them that we love for you to tell, share your experience and not sales pitches. Uh, we're going to let each of you share your information here. Um, one thing on vendors I will note for those who are new to the community, we do not allow salespeople of any kind from any vendor ever. We only allow SMEs, engineers, product people, those who are doing this work. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass to Tom McGregor, who hopefully can unmute from CloudStratX to do his 30-second intro. Tom, Hi there. Am I unmuted? Yes. Excellent. All right. Thanks, JR. Um, look, uh, hi, everybody. My name's Tom McGregor, and I head up the FinOps, cloud, uh, FinOps capability at Cloud Stratex. Um, if you're wondering about the name, Stratex is short for strategy and execution, and that's basically what we do in the FinOps space. We're a client-side consultancy and execution partner whose central philosophy is the incubation of capability within our customers. Um, we've built a standard FinOps incubation model that's been delivered many times to successfully help customers accelerate and establish the maturity of their FinOps capabilities across Thank process. you, Tom. Thank you very much. Awesome. Welcome. Next up is Ruben Vanderstock from Across Cloud. Hey, everybody. Hi, FinOps community. So Across Cloud has joined the FinOps Foundation as a certified training partner. And as a common library and common understanding of the FinOps principles is super important in building out a FinOps uh, practice within your organization, um, we kind of focus on, uh, on these enablement sessions. Next to the FinOps uh, Foundation's training agenda, uh, we also organize classroom uh, trainings throughout Europe for those face-to-face -face discussions. And you can find them on the FinOps Foundation's you, events page. Yes, I actually want to give Ruben an extra shout out. We just launched a new events page. Uh, CrossCloud has a bunch of new trainings on there. Also want to encourage the other training partners to get your trainings on there, because right now CrossCloud has most of them. So great resource and good, good highlight for you, Ruben. Uh, 
Casey Doran from Sync. Welcome. Thanks, JR. Um, great to be back in the mix and see a bunch of familiar faces. So Sync Computing just kind of came out of stealth. Our mission is really to help data engineering folks um, provision the most optimal resources for their data engineering jobs, kind of based on cost, runtime, and eventually carbon footprint. Um, you know, the, the goal there is really to let data engineers focus on their code and not on the infrastructure that, that they want to deploy that in. Uh, we just launched our first free uh, product based on Apache Spark. If that sounds interesting, please hit me up on Slack. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Cool to see some different parts of the ecosystem coming in. Good to have you back, Casey. Uh, Arun Ramakrishnan from Oracle. Are you there? Hey, JR. Um, hey, hey, everybody. Um, so I'm Arun. I'm the product manager for cost management features on OCI or Oracle Cloud Infrastructure for short. The reason we decided to join FinOps is we want to uh, have a seat on the table in this new world where multi-cloud is becoming a reality. We want to make sure we help customers and this organization, like, you know, make FinOps like an essential part of decision making um uh, towards people's cloud journey thanks here thank you arun yeah great to see cloud providers coming in and aligning you know with principles and standards uh, arun posted a great blog post yesterday that breaks down which of their services map to FinOps framework and we're looking to have more and more of the vendors do that so you as practitioners know hey when i need tagging here's where i go right when i need optimization here's where i go in this vendor at this time so check out the vendor profiles on finops.org to learn more about all of these Gonna take a deep breath there and spotlight back to Renata for a minute to see what the uh, live video, or sorry, live drawing is looking like. Do, 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 do. Boom, so you should be able to see Renata there. Let's stop screen share. Oh, didn't do vendors, that's okay. We don't wanna spend too much time on vendors. That was the right call. <laughs> Perfect, so again, you can watch uh, Renata at R-E-N-A-T-T-A -T -T -A in the participant list as we go. All right. What is the cardinal rule of doing live events? You're not supposed to stop screen share and start again. Breaking all the rules. Okay. Boom. All right. So with that, the last uh, vendor highlight we're going to do is each time we do uh, one of these summits, we announce and introduce one of our new premier members. Now, the premier members are vendors uh, or practitioner companies, as we're going to learn here recently, who make a, a multi-year commitment to support the community who join our governing board and bring expertise. And um, excited about this one in particular, I mean, McKinsey, you all have heard of them. They're, they're a little, little firm that uh, does some great work, but uh, Bailey Caldwell uh, is the governing board representative. We're gonna hear from him in just a second. And, you know, I used to be in the vendor space. I was at one of the platforms, uh, you know, selling tooling in the space. And I, I, I used to sell against uh, Bailey for years. He was at Flexera back in the day. Uh, I was at Cloudability back in the day. And, you know, it's great to have somebody like this who, you know, is, been years in the industry, you know, knows it and is now giving back, you know, and contributing across the board. So, you know, Mackenzie, welcome. And uh, Bailey, you want to make your introduction and we'd love to hear more about your journey. Yeah, sure. Thanks, JR. The, the company I was at where um, JR constantly outdid me was uh, called RightScale, which was acquired by Flexera. Um, so nice to see everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, I was going to maybe go to the next page and, and change the conversation a little bit. You know, as practitioners, we focus on waste, we focus on optimization. Um, McKinsey published some work last year uh, that, that's very interesting called the Trillion Dollar Prize. You can find it on our website. Uh, it was actually a rebuttal written by Andres and Horowitz and another article written by Amazon. It picked up some pretty good debates. And it's essentially about changing our perspective from, you know, cost and cost efficiency to revenue impact. And how do we um, actually improve EBITDA which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization for, for those who aren't finance people um, to grow our businesses over the next 10 years. And we did this research with uh, the cloud providers themselves. We did it through a series of interviews. Um, and essentially the rejuvenate category is all about how do you deliver IT and changing the way that you deliver IT to be more efficient and effective. Um, innovate is the concept of public clouds create all this innovation. They release hundreds of services every year. Go there to experiment, go there to build, build new business models. Um, you know, the world's very different than it was pre-cloud and things like Uber and Lyft and, and ride sharing wouldn't be very doable without the public cloud. So this tectonic shift in innovation is really being enabled by those companies uh, that take advantage of the opportunity to grow and scale their business. Um, you can go to the next page here which breaks down the specific categories that we assessed, right? Cost optimization, that's what we all know and love. 
um, resiliency, how to use cloud for HR for your IT services. Uh, again, the latest technologies or, or tech refresh, um, it's just done better in public cloud. So as more and more businesses move into the space, um, this group uh, has a really big job making things more efficient and more effective. But let's all remember the value of cloud is impact on top line revenue and building new businesses and innovating uh, across the ecosystem to deliver faster for your, for your clients and or your direct business. Um, within Cloud by McKinsey, we really do three things. We help discover <clears throat> value and define value and achieve value in cloud with our customers. We help deliver it at a very sort of high-end technical architecture perspective. And then we solve some of the biggest problems in the world relative to technology um, and infrastructure architecture. So I think for all of us as practitioners, go find this article, bring it to your managers and your, and your C-level execs and help them understand that you can't separate your digital transformation from your cloud migration or journey. And that's really the broader context um, that, that I think is critical for all of us to, to collaborate around and to participate in. So yeah, thank, thank you, Bailey. Yeah, and that's I, one of the cool things that happened in 21 as well that you know Bailey is a part of is we started to see the, the GSIs, right? And and uh, as I said, I, I, I worked at Cloudability and the same breath, I always say Cloud Health and I say Densify and I say Cloud Checker and Spot and all the others because the Thanos Foundation is neutral in the same way with the GSIs and the large firms, you know, McKinsey's come in, we've also seen Accenture come in and Deloitte and Software One and these big firms. And what's exciting about that is, is organizations like those are in there doing the executive talk track. And, and Bailey, along with a lot of his peers at these large organizations, uh, you know, did a great working group last year called Adopting FinOps uh, that started to build out this executive talk track that uh, helps get the adoption of FinOps going. So definitely check that out. Uh, excited to have you as part of this. All right, so I think we're mostly on time. We're gonna spend about 45 minutes now digging into the state of FinOps 22 data. Uh, this is, Oh, I'm going to be totally honest here. You're the second group to see this. I did a tiny preview <laughs> for our team and, and the Google Cloud team for part of their, uh, their kickoff. Uh, but this is the first time the community's gotten it. Um, and what we're going to cover are the high level insights around the challenges uh, and different things that people ran into uh, with this in the industry. And we're going to come back in March with more detail uh, around specifically uh, people, salaries, uh, team structures, et cetera. We have a cool panel, a good mix of folks today. Uh, we have pulled in Natalie Daly, who a lot of you recognize from our governing board. She's one of the practitioner representatives from HSBC. We have pulled in uh, Riley Jenkins, who is from our Technical Advisory Council, early, early member of FinOps and uh, a leader on our Technical Advisory Council. Uh, Ashley Romatko, uh, who just left Pearson, we're gonna uh, hear more about her later, but now has joined the FinOps Foundation, uh, one of the original founding members of the FinOps Foundation. Uh, and of course, Bailey, who you just met, and I checked with Bailey on this first, I thought about flubbing it, but I didn't. You'll note, Bailey is not FinOps certified. He has a gray badge over his thing, so I told him I was gonna publicly shame him on that. I think you said you, you, you bought it, but you haven't finished it, right, Bailey? We have purchased in bulk, JR. So had, had legal not taken so long, I would have already been done. It's not my fault. All good, all good. Uh, I think we're gonna, in, in the, the shame back approach, which is a popular in FinOps, we're gonna start Perfect. putting this on all the, all the slides when we introduce speakers. So thanks thanks for taking the first bullet. Uh, so speakers, what, when, when we pass you, why don't you do a quick intro to yourself? Let's not do them all right now, uh, but get right into the content. Uh, and here's the overview on the survey. Uh, we had, as of yesterday, 989 respondents who completed 65 questions representing between 30 to $45 billion in cloud spend. Uh, we know we need 11 more to hit 1,000. And when we launch this on March 10th, I would love to be able to say that we have 1,000. I could flub it now, but I'd prefer not to. Uh, so if 11 of you could go to data.finops.org and take the survey during this, that would be great. Um, you'll see a big distribution of cloud spend across this breakdown. Yeah, some small spenders below a million, a big chunk in the million to 50 million class number of spenders in the 50 million plus. And we did have uh, a handful, I think it was about 10, who were more than a billion dollars a year of public cloud spend, so huge range. This t-shirt I'm wearing, you're all gonna get once uh, our swag producer actually hits their delivery deadline uh, to get them out. I know there's like supply chain issues, they were supposed to be ready today, uh, but you're all gonna get a free copy of this t-shirt. Yours won't be moving and glowing like mine, but if you text me later, I'll give you the secret of how to make that happen. All right, with that, let's go to our panelists. And I want to throw out there, just in panelists, the four of you, maybe throw out your first thought. What do you think was the top pain point for FinOps practitioners in 2022? 
Bailey, throw it out. Uh, organizational support. Okay. Riley? Uh, lack of tooling. Interesting. Okay. Ashley? Chargeback showback. Chargeback showback. Okay. And I just heard Natalie may not be on the line. Natalie, do we have you? Okay. We'll plug her in later. If somebody from the staff can maybe give her a shout to see if she's stuck, that would be great because she's got the final word on this panel. So with that, here were the top from the survey results. Um, back again from last year, getting engineers to take action was the biggest challenge for the FinOps professional. Um, we did see an interesting movement of the ordering here though, which was uh, number two last year was shared cost was the hardest. That moved way down the list uh, and was replaced with accurate forecasting of spend, organizational adoption of FinOps, enabling automation, reducing waste, et cetera, et cetera. These are hard to read, apologies. Um, so, you know, curious to turn to the panelists, you know, what, what were your thoughts on, on these? Were these a surprise? What did, what did you see change? I would yeah, I say, sorry, good. just uh, my answer was correct because engineering is taking action as part of organizational support, JR. Yeah. But, but I'm not surprised to see that, you know, I think with the decentralized nature of cloud and the very fact that it emerges out of businesses and the needs that could be global in some cases, or it could just be um, large scale, it, it's difficult to add all that up into taking action and, and, and taking advantage of some initiatives because the sum of 10 teams wasting a million dollars each is interesting, but the million dollars in any, any individual team may not be a priority from an engineering perspective. Absolutely. Ashley, you were going to jump in too. What was that? Um, I think it's interesting that some of the topics that occur, you know, we've been having a lot of regular conversations about these in Slack. And so I kind of wonder the one about, um, you know, dealing with shared costs, you know, maybe just from being able to collaborate with each other, we've been able to get some more insights to address that issue as well. Um, I, I'm really uh, interested in the one of aligning um, finance and procurement, so aligning your finance practice with those. I think there's definitely like a strength in numbers, and um, I've definitely seen in my area where we spent a lot of time on like talent development and upskilling in those areas, and that's yeah. paid dividends for us. So I'd like to see that one up there. You know, I, I would love to say that we fixed the shared cost issue, but I, I think to that first point there that we, we had a lot less mature people take the survey this year, which is the trend we're seeing in the industry. The entire Global 2000 is coming in and people are just getting started. And, and I, my, my, my hunch is, this is anecdote, not data, is that it's because uh, people just haven't hit the problem as much, right? The advanced practitioners have to do with their costs, but the early stage folks are like, just how do I understand the cost? Where's the waste? And, and I haven't gotten there yet. What do you think, Riley? Yeah, I think that I'm, it, it's been interesting to, to, to yeah, think about and see some of these numbers and, and consider like where everybody fits in their spectrum and where they're coming in. I think that's been something really cool is to see the community grow. And, and a lot of people come in and just say, hey, I'm brand new at this. What should I do? Where should I look? Um, so I'm excited to see what content, especially they, they ask for uh, in relation to some of these top pain points. Absolutely. And hey, Natalie, we have you now. Are you, th are you there? I'm back. Yes. I had to step away for a moment. Welcome. Um, so we're, we're just about through the next one, but quick, quick thought on this slide in terms of uh, pain points. Is this what you expected? Uh, absolutely. Um, and it really does depend. I just caught the last of what the others were saying, but it depends on where you are in uh, your journey. Um, but initially, yes, I would expect to see these observation come up. Yeah. You, you teed yourself up well, folks. At, at the end, Natalie has the last word where we're going to show which challenges related to which stage of the journey. Uh, so have a thought about what you think there's going to be, and she's going to reveal that at the end. Um, quick shout out to the last three bullets there. Um, there's a lot of resources that were built this last year around these. There's an engineering action playbook that a bunch of folks worked on. Um, there's the adopting FinOps and forecasting playbook, shared costs. So check those out if these are challenges. They're all on FinOps.org, uh, all community driven. And thanks to everybody who contributed to those. All right, the next one is about how much spend that you, the uh, purveyors of FinOps could allocate as compared to how much spend they aspired to allocate. And what we saw roughly was that uh, at a median basis, about 75% of spending was allocatable. Uh, however, folks aspired to allocate about 90%. That's where they were trying to get to. So, you know, maybe we start with Ashley on this one. Is is 90% the right aspirational goal? What did you see in, you know, in your organization? Is this, is this a line? 
Yeah, I mean, aspirational, I think, always trying to hit 100% uh, and always knowing that uh, there's those shared costs that you have to deal with. Um, we did a big transformation this last year where we were charging back by like accounts and subscriptions and actually charging back by tags. And so having tag compliance was a really big part of getting this allocation 100% done. Um, I think a lot of your reporting will drive some of these conversations around where you still have gaps in achieving this. And hopefully then when you identify those gaps in your reporting, you can go back to kind of your governments and policies and kind of implement stuff that will get you to greater achievement. What I also think is interesting here is just um, the fact that actuals at 75%, I think this really represents that we still have pain points with like native cloud solutions being able to do chargeback 100%. Um, and there is a lot of, you know, we can, we'll probably get to this later, there's a lot of manual effort, there's a lot of transformation work that goes into actually allocating. And so I think this this kind of addresses that there's still a gap in, in what we get outputted from the native tools and to what we need to deliver to finance. Well, I, I, I want to agree with you and disagree with you on that one, because I, I think you're 100% right that the native tools and the native mapping and tagging and labeling have further to go. However, it, it does seem like most of the folks I've talked to when you get into their data, it's really more about they just didn't tag the things, right? So I, I, I always want to balance like the, the cloud providers should do more, but it's, it's, it seems like the hard challenge is also getting folks to, to do that. Yeah, but JR, tagging is a terrible solution for metered billing at scale in the public cloud. It's the only solution we've had access to. So I'm not knocking anybody, but I think technologically, there's better ways to do stuff like that. And, and I know each of the cloud providers are working on it to make it better um, in the short term. This is a this is a big issue for everybody that, that I talk to. And getting it right means having a good tagging architecture and enforcing it. And that's one of the bigger challenges yeah. is getting people to use it correctly. Yeah, tagging is not the be all end all, right? And that's, I mean, you've got the the layers of uh, a good friend, uh, Vaz, so always talks about the three layers of allocation, right? You've got resource level, you've got the organizational units that like, you know, AWS offers organizations or, you know, GCP projects. And then you've got the meta tagging on top of that, that companies tend to do where you're injecting your own bits. And, and that's actually an interesting segue perhaps to the plans to tackle here on the right. Um, you know, we asked as a second question, how are you gonna prove this? And the first one was definitely let's improve tagging. Then people got into, well, let's improve reporting, right? Let's get the feedback loop. Uh, governance policies was the third. Fourth was improving automation, which is cool to see up to 45%. Uh, number five, which I'm actually glad moved down considerably from last year, was we're going to buy or build tools. I'm a big fan of buying tools. Don't get me wrong. I think most companies need to buy a FinOps platform. However, it does not solve the problem that bad data in, bad data out. So that one moved down. I think a lot of people realize that, you know, that's not the be all end all. I don't like number six. Uh, Natalie, I'm curious your thoughts around this. Number six is enable organizational restrictions. I'm always more a fan of enablement versus restricting. How, how do you handle that at HSBC? <laughs> that's, that's a really interesting point, actually. So, um, you know, for us, it's definitely a mixed bag of all the things that we're, we're talking about. So uh, tagging, tagging strategy was very important. Metadata, having that metadata um, available to us and understanding the right metadata to utilize within our uh, cloud spend, actually having um, bridging data in a way to bridge that cloud data to whatever financial systems were yes. existing in the organization. So understanding the right level to tag and then how you do that mapping. So you can easily, well, easily, you can at least tie the two systems together, which for us and still is in many cases a manual intervention, but at least we have that source data and an automated process to help us with that matching to do that end to end. And as a result, we've managed to charge back consistently 98 to 99% of all of our cloud costs, uh, including the shared costs. And we've done that by, um, like I said, some of, the, some of the things I've highlighted, but with shared costs, we've actually, I suppose, implemented the way the word describes that everyone shared a percentage of those shared costs. And we've mm. been clear to the businesses what those costs include. Yep. But, and we've worked at that as a percentage. And then we've agreed that up front and said, right, you are going to get, you know, for example, 10% on top of your bill for the Google platform, 20% for these, these numbers are arbitrary for AWS, for example, and that's applied in our chargeback process. Um, so that's how we're able to recover those costs and also um, incorporate some of the other unknowns that may come yeah. about 
and then, and then we can also easily identify stray costs, costs that are unknown. Mm -hmm. We can pick that up in the reporting because it doesn't have a home. And then you can proactively deal with that by exception. But, uh, you know, that that took some time to build and implement. Yes. And it definitely is, um, you know, you need that understanding of your organization and how your organization works to, to enable that the right structure using those levers. For sure. I, I The theme I'm, I'm hearing as you talk about this is, you got to build trust in the organization, right? Around the data, around the numbers with the team. And, and I love that you're, you're um, sort of setting expectations with the team about you're going to get charged this because so much yeah. it's, it's about yeah, building that partnership. And, you know, we say a lot like FinOps isn't, it's not a technical discipline. It's really a cultural yeah. communication, you know, mode of working discipline between engineering, between yeah. finance, between all these groups. Um, I want to call it in the chat, uh, Philip Purcell mentioned we need more dimensions, perhaps age of adoption, times and starting FinOps journey, et cetera. Um, the data we're looking at now is largely uncut by maturity or cloud or anything else. When we launch data.finops.org, update it anyway, on March 10th, it's going to have different cuts of the data. Um, also, a lot of our premier vendor member partners are working on different cuts of the data uh, that they're going to do. Like, for example, I'm hoping, you know, Google does a Google Cloud one, for example. Um, and there is a working group. Uh, that you can join. We'll have the link at the end here at State of FinOps Data. If you want to get into this data and do cuts on your own, there's working groups in which you can do that to look at it by different dimensions. Okay, chargeback versus showback. Uh, in a minute, we're gonna we're gonna take an attempt at defining, hopefully once and for all, what these are. Uh, but let's look at the methodology for reporting costs here. Uh, the majority of folks came back and were doing uh, showback. That is, they were providing visibility to spend in order to drive accountability. Uh, and a little less than half were doing chargeback. That is, they were providing the spending and they were including an invoice or a transfer of funds uh, attached to that spending. Uh, I'm gonna go back to you again, Natalie, because in our prep, we had a great, a great thing here. You know, what have you seen in your organization? Which are you doing and how do the two interact? So, so we do both. We started with a phase approach. So first it was about show back and, stand, and standardizing that view across all of our uh, cloud service providers. We have a multi-cloud strategy and, you know, traditionally the billing portals were different. So it was about having that standard view and helping um, our wider uh, uh, counterparts, the businesses, the IT, the engineers, et cetera, to understand uh, those bills. And then we uh, laid in the, the chargeback aspect. And that was, I spoke to some of that previously of how we built that up. Um, now, actually, what we're seeing is I suppose an unexpected evolution in the process. So the businesses and, and the, the IT counterparts have gotten used to seeing this data now. Um, our cloud spend trajectory has increased so much with certain business units that they now want to understand um, more about what's driving some of that cost. So which users are particularly running the queries, not necessarily how the bill is made up, but can we change the way we do business? Now that we're able to actually run this query as and when we want, which we weren't able to do before, is it correct that we should be running it every 15 minutes or should we be running it um, at a different time slot? So we're now looking at, we, we built our FinOps tooling and our Philips to FinOps target operating model to talk to technology and engineers and finance, we're now looking at a pilot of how we then translate that for the business themselves, which is a new challenge for us, but an exciting one. Awesome. I, I'm getting the uh, the notice that we're, we're behind in time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick us up a little bit here. Um, Joe, can you jump in with a quick rundown on this one? I know this is uh, your favorite slide. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There is always a good conversation about chargeback versus show showback going on. So I grabbed some of the conversation out of uh, the SIG Finance Slack channel. Um, basically, chargeback, showback, very similar. You absolutely need a good tagging label account subscription strategy in order to, in observability in order to do either. Um, I love Parker Nancola's uh, quote here. It's not only a good t-shirt, but it, it's, it breaks it down very good. Chargeback equals showback plus invoice, meaning you're doing the showback reporting plus you're moving the expense to the cost causer. Um, Amy Ashby saying, hey, I leverage both. What finance does for chargeback isn't necessarily the exact sort of reporting that she's showing her developers, infrastructure engineers, or other leaders. Um, so when it comes down to it, well, are you using chargeback? Are you using showback? When we talk to companies, it's very dependent 
on and, their companies. And it's not a measure of maturity, I think is the key thing. People think chargeback yeah. is the be all end all and it's, it's not necessarily. Absolutely. So data point, we're not gonna go to the panel on this one, it's just time, but how do you facilitate chargeback from the survey? Top survey answer was we do it manually with spreadsheets. And that is unfortunately still uh, the way of the world. Uh, we saw more automation coming in, you know, to integrate into other systems, but this is still a hard problem that is not completely solved by computers yet. There's still a lot of manual process. Let's talk about forecasting. And I'm gonna go to Ashley and then Riley on this one. Uh, in 22, we saw the benchmarks for forecasting get tighter. Walk people said 10%, run people said 5%. What's what's your take on this, Ashley? Where were you targeting, and are these are these levels achievable? Yeah, it's really interesting. When this the FinOps CFS FinOps survey came out last year, and I saw twelve percent in the run, that was my target, right? So we we tried to aim towards that. So I love that the foundation puts together these benchmarks that can work towards. Um, I see that this year, you know, run is five percent, but fourteen percent of respondents are hitting that. That kind of shows you where you need to be if you want to be in that top tier of the run. So I like the way that this is um, represented. Um, I think. You know, a lot of doing accurate forecasting is can be very time consuming um, as well. And so we're constantly looking on how we can kind of automate and reduce a lot of that toll um, because you are constantly having to get the right information from key stakeholders and get the right sign off and things like that. So we've we've worked a lot in this area this last year um, to get our accuracy into that variance range. Um, and so I'm glad to see those numbers. I think we ended last year about eight percent. So Ooh, that's good. That's good. Eight percent is up there. Riley? Same thoughts here. I mean, we, we've we kind of looked at the, the forecasting thing as kind of almost an afterthought, honestly, because we were focused on getting to understand the data. But as we got more to the run phase, uh, we realized that all of the efforts that we had done before really prepped us to be able to forecast. So we shoot for about a four, four to five percent. But I'm not surprised to see that kind of a spread as people go through their maturity. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to push back on you a little bit, Riley. I, although I, I have, you know, I've seen you go through this for years. I would say you're probably damn close to run stage. It's my personal opinion that <laughs> nobody really can ever hit run in this space because yeah. it's so ever changing and it's evolving. And um, we actually found some really interesting data in the survey about people who said they were runners who were reporting lower numbers than those who said they were walkers, right? And so we actually moved yeah. to a lot to who's who's at the top of the group. Um, yeah. All right, so next topic, and this forecasting, by the way, there's a forecasting room in Slack, there's a project for this. If you want to continue the conversation, dig in there. Such a nuanced concept. Uh, another question we asked was, how frequently do you update your forecast? And I think this is a great measure for people to look at. Got to advance the slide here, sorry, two screens, which is most people are still doing it monthly. And that's, you know, fine. Um, however, cloud spending does tend to move more quickly than a monthly cadence. And look at the quarterly folks, that's a huge chunk. Uh, again, when we cut it, this by run and walk, we see more weeklies, uh, we see that moving down, but definitely something to look at and compare for your own. Uh, I think finance people, you know, like to do things on monthly and quarterly basis, but uh, cloud doesn't necessarily move at that speed. So let's talk about integration of other business data with cloud spend. Um, Natalie, you had mentioned this earlier. I know Bailey, we've been talking about this. Um, what we saw from the data was Two questions here on the left, what are people integrating into their cloud spend data? Utilization was one, you know, right sizing all that jazz, IT finance, general business data, uh, CMDB, which I'm guessing ties to mapping and allocation. It was really cool to see revenue data starting to come in here and sustainability data, small, mighty, but growing. Uh, and then on the right side of this was what are they actually doing with the data to drive change? And the top was to drive more culture. Then we got into budgeting and forecasting. Number three, love it using unit cost and you know activity-based metrics to drive decisions at the executive level. Um, these are the real outcomes of FinOps in my mind. Bailey, I mean, you're talking to a lot of execs and folks who are doing this. How are you seeing this data use and where do you see this play out most in the organization? Yeah, I mean, the one, this is all great stuff, right? And I think that the this, this new um, supply chain that we call cloud, right, is, is a digital platform that you need to integrate continually more and more with systems. Uh, and I think, frankly, just to tie back to a prior slide, you know, monthly forecasts, people do that because it's hard and because it's a manual process and they have to sit down with spreadsheets and talk to people. So I think it's, there's a lot of opportunity to drive forecasting with automation as part of this data in integration model, um, especially when you look at revenue data, right? So unit costs as a function of sales on your e-commerce platform or you know, however you engage with your with your client is a great way to do forecasting and all of that needs to be automated because it happens in real time. 
The other piece that, that I think is very important is the sustainability data. Um, look back to the problem I said earlier, if there's 10 people wasting a million dollars each, you know, the sum of the whole is, is compelling, but the piece parts themselves may not um, cause action. Bringing sustainability into the conversation about cloud optimization and understanding that there's a higher order purpose than just saving money or being cost efficient related to this move to a green economy. And I think us as FinOps practitioners, um, you know, have access to the data that can also help bring visibility to sustainability as, as you move from shutting data, center to, data centers down to the public cloud, um, you're still gonna wanna track that. So I think that's an area we're gonna see grow a lot this year. JR, you're on mute. For the lip readers in the room or the non-lip readers, I was saying sustainability is a working group that we are finally kicking off. There's a sustainability room. We've got some great uh, board sponsorship for that. I think uh, uh, Daryl from Software One is sponsoring that. Um, get involved, please. This is a big area. You're seeing all the cloud providers start to come out with you know, carbon measures. We wanna standardize some of this against cloud cost. Um, great to see that. Um, we are short on time, but I, I, I do wanna go back to uh, Ashley here because I know you did a lot of work in your organization with getting executive mandates and buy-ins. You know, where, where do you see this data working and, and where is it not? with telling the story of cloud spend. Yeah, we, we this was really important for us uh, to integrate a lot of our, our data with our business metrics, especially when we wanted to get to real-time reporting. So a lot of our um, like metadata around like product owners and business units was in our CMDB. And so focus heavily on integrating that data and then not putting so much pressure on the engineers having to tag a lot of resources with those values. Um, I think all of that helped us really enable our, our culture because we were able to get that data in real time to the individuals that were needed based on the metadata that we could scoop up from other platforms. Yeah, I think for me, this the takeaway in this one is it's like a, it's FinOps is a data game, right? And, and to, to win and to get better, you got to leverage all this data together to tell the story, which brings us to how to leverage that data in a more proactive fashion versus reactive and automation. Uh, so this mildly confusing graph here is showing the top items that people said they were automating. Uh, those items are split by crawl, walk, run and pre-crawl. So the, the runners are these orange folks uh, and the top things they're automating are this list you here, reporting of spin, tagging hygiene, spend anomalies. You'll see this go down and down and down a lot of different areas. Really good number to see this year, inverse of what we saw with the maturity comment we mentioned earlier, the folks who reported a little or no automation went way down in 2022, 49% in 21, uh, the 22 data, which I guess is technically 21 data for looking backwards, but this, this most recent said only 30%. Uh, so that was great to see. Riley, uh, you are an engineer doing FinOps. What's your view on automation? Are these the right things? And where does this go over time? Yeah, I mean, uh... I mean, automate all the things is how I'd like to generally think of uh, FinOps. I mean, we the the focus on making sure that I, I really liked what I saw in the in the chat was a uh, uh, tagging from birth. Uh, I like that <laughs> concept of that when you bring something into the world of a of a cloud spender that you're actually setting it up in a way that you can do not all the engineering job and the work, but also all the other things you need to do FinOps um, reporting and tagging um, or whatever how you break down your costs. So it's really cool to see that. There seems to be a little bit more of an understanding that FinOps does have a major component in automation and it's a part that is fundamental to being successful. And I'll kind of jump in here too. I think, you know, that's what keeps us interested as well as being able to innovate. And that means reducing the toil on areas that we don't want to focus time on. Um, we launched a new data lake with AWS this last year, took doing the bill from two days down to under two hours. That frees up time for us to go out and work with more engineers teams on optimization or launch new capabilities. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really happy to see how much automation has gone up from last year. I think just one additional thing here, I think what it also enables or what it has for us is um, self-service for some of those teams as well. So creating dashboards in third party tools where they can actually access their bills real time. Um, and we're able to demonstrate straight off the back of, a, of implementation of some sort of optimization, the bill reduction, and then they can literally lift that and use that with their businesses. So, um, you know, I think this is an excellent list. Yeah, and and it's hugely valuable. One sec. Uh... Oh, oh, we got some. So, hey, JR, just 
just real quick, let me chime in as well here, because I think automation is absolutely a critical component. And, you know, from my perspective, FinOps will do to finance and engineering what DevOps did to operations and engineering. And although it's too long a word, it really should be DevSec FinOps, and we should shift left as an engineering discipline, the financial controls associated with the infrastructure that we run, just like we did with security. Yeah. Um, just like we did with operations. So I think that's a huge opportunity for, for the industry, to be honest. You, you got a plus one for DevSec FinOps in the chat. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's all the things plus ops one. and, you know, it's wh whatever we call it. It's about doing this iteratively and, and doing it in a way that, you know, I think is matches the speed of cloud. So um, on the last one here in automation, the next question we got was around what are the barriers? What is blocking you from automating? And thought it was really interesting that the first one was actually a people challenge. Technical resources referred to staff. Ashley, you're working a lot in the talent development area. What's your take on this? Yeah, I'm not surprised by this. I mean, when you think about um, you know, forming a FinOps team, typically you're pulling from different areas of your business to form this team. And there is some upskilling and uplifting to do within your FinOps team if you're going to be the ones building the automation or maybe you're leveraging a virtual team. And when you leverage a virtual team, you've got to get them to understand the FinOps, you know, what we're trying to do to implement the automation. So I wasn't surprised by that. Um, I, I think the other one that, I, you know, call out were there was also like the change management. I, you know, I always talk about if I could go back to a company that was starting at the ground, we would put in a lot of this automation in place. It's very difficult when you're a large enterprise company to go back and overlay some automation and mandated policies via, via automation. I love when people say, you know, don't build a resource without tagging. That's very, you know, very difficult when you're already seven years into a cloud to overlay some <laughs> of those policies. So um, I, 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 I like seeing that and I, uh, here that's interesting. Yeah, if I can jump in on this one, it's Please. kind of interesting because I, I think of it um, maybe just because I'm an SRE, so I think of everything of what chart can I look about about what system. But I, I see FinOps as being something like if you can get your, you know, who's ever interacting with your cloud, like whether it's your monitoring teams or your individual engineering teams, if you can make it so that they understand that, hey, you can also look up your server metrics and your performance metrics by the same dimensions that you can do your cost they start to understand that they they see it in a different light than if they're just like, oh, some FinOps person wants me to automate tagging so they can look at a report. If you make it so that, hey, your monitoring aligns with your system discovery so you can look at what servers are what, and then also that shows in your costs, they start to say, oh, I'm, it makes sense to, to, to spend a little bit more time investing in you know, get, making it so that these FinOps reports work. Um, yeah. That's kind of how I think about the whole space and at the risk of a personal soapbox rant like the finops team shouldn't be this outside team that doesn't yeah. have engineering expertise that isn't driven from engineering like riley you started finops from engineering mike fuller who's our tech chair started from engineering we're gonna hear from benjamin coles from apple he's an engineer who works in finance I mean, to me it's like you've got to have engineering expertise on that team and it's got to be engineers talking to engineers uh, as part of it so really critical to get over that trust issue as well um, how long before cost anomalies were investigated? This is from the survey. Turns out most people take days. Now I'm going to call out something we noticed yesterday, which is probably a flaw in our survey. There was not a week's option on this, this year. So we have a lot of people who said days. So we don't know if days is two days or 22 days. Um, but in reality, I, and you know, I think, you know, let's ask you, Natalie, how, how long do you think this should be? Now, I'm not even asking where you are, but in a, in a high functioning practice, how quickly should you be addressing anomalies? Hours, I would say. Hours. Okay. Um, because, you know, every moment that passes, unnecessary spend predominant, you know. For, for us, we, we try and get it in hours. Um, there are some things that um, impede that ability sometimes. So the feeds might not necessarily come through as quickly as we would like, or the data doesn't reconcile. But generally, we can spot and, and react, or at least uh, draw attention to anomalies. And if you've got um, alerting in place, so that's the next level, if you've got some budget alerting in place, yeah. that can actually, um, without any human intervention, notify those who are in, you know, in control of the, the funding and the budget, that there something looks a little bit out of out of sync here should requires investigation that also helps but yeah i the goal should be hours in my opinion uh, so, agreed and there's some plus one 
Sorry, this one. No, no worries. I was saying there's great things in the chat around, uh, you know, anomalies can be a day behind because spending data can be behind. I think this is more about when you know about them, how quickly do you get to them and can you automate as much of that as possible and also shout out in there. Oh, I guess that was you actually saying that these can also identify security issues. We have seen so many times when, you know, something has gotten compromised and it was identified in cost data first. So really important to be tracking these. Moving forward a bit because of time, how do you, man how often do you manage your commitment based Discounts, so RIs, savings plans, CUDs, monthly cadence. Really, folks? I'm looking at the larger 900 people who responded. I mean, 2015, I give a talk at reInvent and RIs, and we're telling people, like, get out of that cadence, right? Do it just in time. Do it as needed. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are still there. Uh, Biweekly, better. Weekly, fantastic. When prompted by tooling, I think that's probably a good one. Uh, I think takeaway here uh, is really just do it as the infrastructure needs, not necessarily when you think of it. And that's where the runners are heading. All right, let's spend a little time on the last two slides with the panel. Um, and I'm gonna start with you, Bailey, on this one. Let me let me describe for the group here what we have covered here, which is um, essentially on the x-axis, we ask people to rate their FinOps culture from zero to 10. It's your culture a two, a five, a 10. The y-axis is the percentage of people who rated that. Now the colors, and this is really confusing, sorry, because it's a matrix, the colors are by self-reported maturity. So the far right bar, you see uh, basically the vast majority of run stage people rated their culture high, right? And on the far left, you see the vast majority of pre-call people rated their culture low. What I thought was really interesting in this is that you had some walk stage people who rated their culture off the charts high, which gets back to the point of his run really thing and walk, et cetera. Um, you know, Bailey, what's your take on this one? This one's a little confusing for me. Is FinOps maturity distinct from culture? Are the two married? And can you push them forward at different speeds? How does that play out? Yeah, I know. I mean, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, part of what I was talking about earlier, hopefully gives a, a broad strategic top-down perspective of the importance of cloud in this tectonic shift that we're going through as an industry. Um, Andy Jassy, 2020 former CEO of AWS said that 5% of global IT budgets, that's $4.2 trillion is spent on public cloud. That number is going to move to 60%, depending on which analysts you talk about or talk to over the next five to seven years. So uh, the, 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 the game is getting bigger. The amount of money at stake is getting bigger. Um, the, the failures will be bigger. From my perspective, you have to have that executive support top down, even though largely FinOps as a set of practitioners has been a, a ground bottoms up. Um, hey, let's do better and innovate a better way to do this. So from my perspective, um, you can't spend too much time talking about culture and building a strategy around it. And by the way, you can't spend, you can't start this work soon enough. I run into a lot of companies yeah. that are in a large scale migration and they say, oh, we don't have time. We're dealing with all this technical debt and we're lifting shifting to the public cloud. Um, it's, you know, it's 10 times more expensive to do this a year and a half later than it is to do it now in terms of building a FinOps culture and, and then enabling all the capabilities and the outcomes. Yeah, amen. I, I was glad to see that executive directive was the top way to do this. Uh, last year, when we did the question around how do you get engineers to take action, we saw a lot of people saying grassroots things like gamification, you know, like just visibility and showback. But the run stage people really had that top down directive happening. You know, heads of engineering, CTOs, VPs, whatever the organizational structure was saying cost is an important part of your job engineers. And that's something we're doing on an ongoing basis, right? This is not a retroactive approach. This is part of our daily work. Uh, Ashley, you did a lot of work uh, at Pearson around, you know, executive buy-in. How did you get that executive directive and support going to support the, the culture? Yeah, so we were kind of interesting where our FinOps had started in like a silo business unit where we had a really strong executive. Um, and then we moved to our FinOps team to be global, right, to span all of our business units. And so there was a lot of, uh, you know, reconvincing all the different business units of the need for the FinOps practice. And I, I think, you know, data gamification is listed as number four, but I wrap that up as in data, like just you know, you have, that's the power that FinOps team has. You have that data visible and right in front of you and being able to produce those and get those reports to directives. And I think another part of the executive buy-in is we have to remember we have to educate our executives a lot of the times. They may not be as familiar with what savings plan are or reservations are. And so spending a lot of time um, educating the executive showing them where other organizations are benchmarked and telling them where we are. And, you know, almost gamifying that with the executive of where we should be. Um, that was really powerful for us. 
Awesome. So we're over on time. I'm going to give Natalie a final word. Natalie, if you can keep it under a minute. Uh, these were the results split by maturity of the top challenges. You'll note getting engineers take action moves around different places. Can you give us a, a quick view of your own journey at HSBC through this and how it aligns or, or differed from these challenges by maturity? Oh, okay. So I think initially, just, just off the back of what Ashley was saying, uh, executive sponsorship has been a constant for me, um, early stages and even now. Um, being able to articulate the need for uh, FinOps organization and the benefit, more importantly, the value that we, we can um, generate throughout the, the organization and the difference we make to the bottom line in terms of cost um, was generally how we managed to hold their attention. Uh, getting the engineers to um, take action in the early stages, uh, I think building that curiosity and implementing a target operating model from the start that included um, organizations or teams that didn't generally talk to each other. So finance, engineers, um, you know, uh, platform leads, etc. Uh, and then being part of the build out of the target operating model, and then also um, forming the forums that we worked in, uh, that was really important. And now the engineers yeah. um, come to us with ideas. So the, the action part is kind of uh, turned around on us to actually keep up with some of the engineers' ideas oh, yeah. and the things that they want to do, which is amazing um, and very much a part of, of um, how we work day to day. Still, you know, a, a long way to go, but yep. you can definitely see that shift. It's a never ending journey. And, and with that, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end the panel because we have a breakout at the end and hoping the panelists can join that to dig in deep, more deeply on this. Uh, sorry, the, the breakout is actually going to be in this main room. You can stay in this room to dig in more with the panelists. Uh, we have some other breakouts happening. Um, thank you, the four of you, uh, for your insights. And yeah, let's, looking forward to continuing the conversation. For the people on the call, we want you to get involved with this data. You can discuss it in Slack. Take the survey again. We, we got to do something for the thousandth person. Steve, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give you some fancy, fancy thing if you're the thousandth person to take it. Um, a lot of this data feeds into working groups and projects. There's a URL there. Uh, we want feedback on this also, March 10th. And, and by the way, folks, we're, we're not done. It says Great Summit. There's more coming. Don't leave. We got another 30 minutes. Um, we want feedback on this data. We actually publish it. It, it, uh, it kicks off March 10th. So let us know what makes sense, what doesn't. Okay, so on March 10th, we are going to cover these topics. Salary ranges reported, seniority of teams, team sizes and growth, how to get executive support, and also containers and more. I want to welcome, though, and introduce a couple new people as we get into the, the next stage of content. Um, one of the things we've heard a lot is <laughs> we've done a lot of work with practitioners. We've got 5,300 of you in the community. Uh, the practitioners sometimes need help with their organizations, the companies themselves, to get this adoption happening. Uh, so we're rolling out a new FinOps uh, for Enterprises membership program, which is part of uh, following the CNCF model of, of end user adoption, uh, which is going to be a concierge training and membership program. And I'm super excited to announce the first one of those. And I, I honestly, this we almost didn't even plan this timing, which just worked out, uh, is our good friend Benjamin Coles at Apple. Apple has joined the FinOps Foundation as a premier member. Uh, Benjamin is now on our governing board. I'm going to publicly shame Benjamin. You see he's got the gray badge, too. He is not yet FinOps certified. I'm told he bought it. Uh, and the great thing, and Benjamin, I'll pass to you here in just a second, I love about your story is you are an engineer who works within the CFO organization, driving infrastructure services and FinOps and then Apple. Uh, yeah, can you take a minute or two, introduce yourself and talk about why you're joining? Thank you, JR. Uh, yeah, I'll get that certification done ASAP. Uh, so, uh, introduction. I've been at Apple for 11 and a half years and my roots were working here in the Bay Area for the past 22 years for companies that were startups, education, and enterprise. My unique perspective enabled me to become an SRE, data center, capacity planner, business analyst, and eventually an engineering leader in finance. In the past two years, I've noticed that the tide is changing for financial analysts. Traditionally, these analysts would be limited to Excel spreadsheets and number crunching from rolled up reports from other lines of business. We've had this exciting wave come through where we've started talking about cloud, but one pattern I'm seeing is that finance and engineering are talking different languages. By joining this, I'm hoping to bridge that gap. I want to level up the financial analyst to use proper tools and make decisions with ETL pipelines. On the engineering side, I want to emphasize with them and help find ways to help them become partners to our cause because 
by becoming efficient, we can alloc allocate dollars for other exciting projects or ex expanding teams. One of these ways I'm hoping to help us is with FinOps for Enterprise. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ashley to tell you all about it. Thanks. Thanks, Benjamin. I can really like resonate with you. Um, you know, we often like really underestimate the uplift of talent, especially in our finance organizations. Um, but they're so critical for us to, you know, be able to adopt this journey. So I'm really thrilled to have Apple and you joining us as our first enterprise member. And, you know, I think between our collaboration, not only we're going to help tackle your challenges, but we're going to be able to bring all those insights back to the rest of the community. Um, so a little bit of backstory about myself, you know, I joined the Finance Foundation when I was really looking to accelerate Pearson's finance practice, it's been a little over three years now. Um, and I've learned so much from this community along the way. I've served on the TAC, I've taught the practitioner course, I've led the adoptee finance working group, and recently I've been working on building the course modules. So joining the you know, F2 staff, for me, it really kind of feels like bringing this all full circle where I've been able to get support from you guys and now we can bring the enterprise membership um, to help the community to get the same support that I have as well. Um, kind of a little bit of backstory myself, you know, I did manage uh, one of the largest FinOps teams we had, uh, we spanned about five time zones, I had 10 different staff, we supported 400 plus engineers, and about an annual budget of $6 million. Um, the team uh, that I led really helped develop all the custom reporting for the engineering teams. We performed yearly quarterly forecasts for over 800 AWS accounts, and we've developed an optimization program that helps save $15 million in three years. So anybody here's from Pearson, I want to give you a huge kudos, um, but I'm very much looking forward to this journey. So along with me joining is also Ben. So I'm going to turn to Ben to give a little introduction as well. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Um, so a little bit of uh, a little bit of previous statement. Um, I actually put this slide together after the beginning of this summit. I didn't tonight. know this slide so, was here, Ben. Well done. There you go. <laughs> Magic, Sticky, right? I know. It's like Ashley was like, hey, do you want to do a slide? Yeah, OK. Um, cool. So I came to the FinOps Foundation a few years ago when I started working with a consultancy company called CloudReach. Uh, so shout out to anybody from CloudReach who's on the call. Love you, Lowe's. Um, basically working with our customers and uh, sorting out the, uh, the sort of cloud cost. It was called cost control at that time. Um, moving away from there to Sky, which was an incredible journey, um, helping to build out the FinOps practice from pretty much kind of standing start across their streaming platform services. Um, and then 2021, I, got, I kind of got completely crazy with the training stuff and taught over 200 people doing the FinOps, FinOps Practitioner course, which was just so much fun. If you were one of the people on uh, at one of the courses I taught last year, thank you. Every single one of those was so much fun. It was awesome. Um, and also, yeah, I've been, as mentioned earlier on, I've been building the FinOps pro Professional course too. So lots of training, lots of coaching um, throughout kind of the entire gamut of, of industry. So engineers, finance, leadership, everybody. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, um, for my sins, I spent um, you know, a long time working at Oracle. So uh, hi, Oracle folks. I spent a long time working at Oracle doing the uh, doing data center engineering and Unix engineering and stuff like that too. So that was cool. And uh, yeah, the banjo, you got to have a hobby, right? <laughs> <laughs> got to have a gimmick. Uh, I, I'm gonna, I think as one of your starting OKRs, Ben, we're going to uh, make sure that you deliver the first FinOps branded waistcoat uh, as part of a swag item that everyone is going to want. Oh, well, yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> that needs to happen. <laughs> I love that. Well, thanks, Ben. And yeah, thanks for working in real time to get the slide deck in here. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about the enterprise membership. It's going to be a new paid membership for organizations that are really looking to accelerate their FinOps uh, adoption of the framework. We're going to offer both private and also scaled training for your organization. We're going to have additional concierge services that's going to help you with uh, recruiting uh, talent. And we're also going to be unlocking a lot of other community benefits. So more to come, a little teaser on, on that. I do want to mention, um, going to the next slide, that Joe, Ben, and I are really joining forces here. Um, you know, we've been very passionate about this and we're excited to get, you know, kind of put our heads together and be able to provide these enterprise memberships, you know, dedicated guidance to the adoption stages, uh, through the framework. We're going to be including both assessments and training for your organizations. We're also going to be providing exclusive services to help en enhance the community engagement that you get here. Um, between the three of us, we've built and scaled FinOps practices of Fortune 100 companies um, really across the top four cloud providers, and we're based in the US and UK. So you're going to get the full global experience from us. Um, 
And so just to let you guys know how to get ready, we're, we're just really in that soft launch. So I do want to you know, thank Benjamin, who's joined us as our first enterprise member as we start to roll out this launch this next month. Over the next few weeks, what I'm going to be doing is going and uh, meeting with different enterprise companies and starting to really refine what are the benefits and services that we have to offer. You can stay informed with all the updates about this new program by joining the Finance for Enterprise channel. You can also go to the website and fill out the form if you're interested in learning more or just Slack me directly. Um, but I'm really, really, really thrilled to be here and launch this membership and hopefully help accelerate the rest of the community along the way. Thank you, Ashley. I, I feel so honored to be working with the, the dream team of all of you. And um, I mean, the brain trust around the amount of FinOps experience you have is phenomenal. So thank you all for, for joining us and making the leap. Um, I do want to clarify, nothing is changing for all of you individual members. We're going to, our focus is still entirely on supporting the individuals, um, free membership, no changes there. Uh, this for us is really about helping accelerate, as I said, the organizations um, and providing a venue for those who really want to plug in more to get you pointed to the right resources, sometimes to the right tooling and service partners, sometimes to the right training. You know, we're here to help. So um, engage with these folks. Uh, they're here for you. If you're an individual and need something, reach out to them and they'll get you going in the right direction. If you want to explore the program for your company, talk to Ashley. All right, with that, I'm going to kick over to the Technical Advisory Council. Again, this is the group that votes on the working group's best practices and standards that go into the framework. You'll recognize Riley there, his face was from the panel. Uh, we're gonna hear from Melvin here in a minute, we get to government, uh, but I'm gonna pass to our TAC staff liaison, Vasilio Markinastasakis and Anders Hogman from Spotify to talk about what's happening in the TAC. Thanks, JR. Um, let's go to the next slide. Hey, everybody. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about all things TAC for the next few slides. Uh, the first thing, um, just to bring awareness to the fact, if you don't already know, is we're uh, looking for two new TAC members. We have two open uh, practitioner seats. We'll be hosting an election next week. And these are the folks that have uh, put their names forward uh, to join our TAC. Um, these folks are practitioner members, part of our community. A lot of these folks you may have already worked with on working groups, um, and we're super excited to see how many folks are eager to get involved with our uh, Technical Advisory Council. Uh, some key dates and some housekeeping. Again, Jared, if you just go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, we have two open uh, seats we're looking to fill. Uh, and some of the key dates that are coming up um, introducing you to the TAC candidates, which we just did. And then our TAC is reviewing our uh, TAC candidate sheets. These are essentially um, uh, uh, mini profiles where each individual candidate talks a little bit about why they're passionate about FinOps, uh, how they want to help the community. And um, uh, obviously our TAC members will review those uh, ahead of the election that's coming up on the 15th. And bonus, we will also be choosing a new TAC chair at that election. So again, just mostly uh, covering all this so everyone uh, is aware of what's going on with our TAC. Other things that are happening with the TAC is since the FinOps Foundation was started, um, you know, we have been operating with uh, a, what we call a bootstrap TAC strategy. And it's time in discussions with the TAC and the community, it's time that we revisit our strategy and what we use to guide our working groups and our vision moving forward to best serve the community. So with that in mind, we started a, a working group to collect some information around how to best inform refreshing that tax strategy. And I was really lucky uh, to have the opportunity to work with Anders Hagman from Spotify. Anders, are you on the call? And can I uh, uh, hand off to you to chat a little bit about our journey so far and um, sort of the work we've been doing? Of course, was and I, I think I'm the lucky one to get to work with you, and I can't really grow that beard. And so but I'm looking forward towards that collection of great beards here. We're going to talk about something else than FinUp for a moment, actually. We are going to talk about space and astronauts and, and the collaboration across cultures. So, so me and Vas are working on this sprint to find out what should the TAC be doing. And I came to think of this, this project that's a while ago. It's about 20 years ago, the International Space Station. It has been described as the most expensive thing or item ever constructed. It was estimated to cost something like 150 billion US before it got launched, so 150 billion. And we, we deal with this number sometimes, but estimates vary widely and it costs maybe 3 billion a year 
to run it. And since all of you guys love unit economics, uh, the equivalent of like a person day on this space station is about 7.5 million US. One astronaut, one day, seven and a half million dollars. So that's how expensive it is in terms of unit economics. But in looking at from another lens, it's the equivalent of maybe buying one coffee for one European every year, like just looking at the European part of financing this space station. So I'm super happy to pay for that one cup of coffee per year. I think it's well worth it. So, so that's the space station. Uh, incidentally, it will be up there for another 10 years, which will be about $30 billion more to, to run it, which is about the same as the state of Finland. So we're say, sort of in this symbol part, if you look at it that way. So, right, now for the quote on this page. I mean, this project was super frustrating to some people, that, especially the ones speaking English. And um, I, I, I came to think of JR and Mike Fuller and some other sort of early astronauts when it comes to FinOps. They now have to have conversations with me in broken English, and they have to collaborate with people out of all kinds of cultures. And they, I think they feel some of that frustration that this astronaut expressed at the time when I say stuff like, yeah, that's really not how I look at how, how, how I believe we should do things. And they get like, yeah, we usually just sit down a bunch of us and we decide how to do stuff. They can no longer do that. Yet the tech needs to unlock a lot more passion and energy that sits with the rest of the community who's now coming very much throughout from the rest of the world. And we need to measure the outcomes. We need to learn faster. And there's a lot of adjacent areas where the cloud can actually make money. Not, we're not here to save money. You remember that from the sort of the book, reading the book, right? So how do we know all of this stuff? Well, we're gonna build out the tax strategy kernel, sort of looking at it right now. We're doing the diagnosis, interviewing a bunch of people. And then we're gonna create the guiding policy, the sort of where will we take sort of the track, tax track strategy work. And then we're gonna describe what are we going to do to tackle these kind of challenges. So, so I think uh, that, that's sort of the, the kernel that we're looking at. And uh, how come I knew all this stuff that I just talked about, like what we needed to do? Well, we talked to some interesting people. Perhaps that's the next slide here, Vas. Uh, there, there's the slide. All right, so we did some interviews over the past couple of weeks. We're running this as a bit of a sprint. The strategy is not ready to share yet, but thanks for the input to everyone on, the, on this list. And I think we're, we're trying to now complete the diagnosis part and we're gonna present something to the TAC to digest and see, is this the strategy, the direction we wanna take the TAC for the coming sort of year? And uh, I'm looking forward to completing this work, but we don't have much more to share with you for the moment. If you have input, our names, me and Vas, our contact details were on the first slide there, please send something if you would like to get engaged on this. And uh, I Did think the output I would really like to see myself is that more of you guys are engaged. And also we start like working on some of these challenges that the state of FinOps helped us inform, inform us about. So thank you so Andrew, much. I was gonna say you, you, all can, you all can get in touch with us uh, through Slack as well. Perfect. Thank you, Anders and Vaz for leading that. Uh, in honor of your uh, space theme, I'm gonna pull this thing up slowly, get some space going on for the rest of this. Uh, looking forward to see the outcomes of that. And that, by the way, is the secret to how my shirt is glowing. It's actually green screen color, and I have a green screen app running. All right, so with that, Melvin, are you on the line to tell us about all the great work that is happening in the government working group? I am, how's it going? Great. All right, so uh, good. I think it's still, more, it's actually good afternoon now. So M Melvin Brown, I'm the deputy CIO with the Office of Personnel Management here uh, at the federal government in the United States. And so we had the opportunity to start working and adopting FinOps uh, within OPM. And we discovered that there are some significant differences to how the commercial sector does it and how we would do it in the federal government. And so we wanted to kind of start talking about this framework for, for adopting FinOps. Um, there, there's a couple of things that, that we do. You know, we've got a ton of things that are around how we procure cloud. And then there's the setting up and the use and the manage of cloud. Next slide. But then when we start to look at 
you know, how that looks. You know, we've got a ton of government policies and directors around cloud and, and telling us to go to the cloud and move to the cloud and rationalizing the cloud. But what we don't have is any frameworks uh, that are prescriptive enough to help us with the setup of cloud usage and how do we manage uh, cloud uses once we move to the cloud. Uh, one of our biggest challenges is, and, and I heard it spoken about earlier around tagging. And so uh, it was good to have that from the outset because I've, I've managed a cloud environment where you didn't tag and it was just what we call a hot mess. Uh, the, the meter was running and we had no way to reconcile our costs. And so uh, now that we're starting with a clean sheet of paper uh, here at, at OPM, I'm excited that uh, the engineers are not allowed to spin up anything that's not tagged and we've automated some core tags going forward. So we're starting with automation in mind uh, and I'm happy uh, to report that. So what does this playbook look like? Next slide, please. Uh, so we started with the differences. And so one of the things that we wanted to talk about is the basic adoption of FinOps, you know, getting a sponsor, identifying subject matter experts, determining what you're, what you're gonna put in the cloud. Those things are pretty standard. But in the government, there are some unique differences. The procurement of the cloud is different. I mean, we have uh, two people, there's somebody in finance, there's somebody in contracting that both have to be involved with the procurement of cloud. Most of the time we can only do procurements once a year. And so understanding that um, from the outset, it's gonna be different. And so what do we have to change uh, for how we procure cloud? In addition to that, um, in the commercial world, an engineer can commit the company to buying reserves it's the same day. You know, in the government right now, we've got to get our contracting officers used to the fact that an engineer is getting ready to commit the government to buying more cloud services. That's a clearly a cultural shift from the way things normally operate. You know, our relationship with our cloud providers and resellers, we always have to go through a formal contracting process. I can't just pick up the phone and tell AWS that I like to get services and, and meet with them and, and establish a contract. Doesn't work that way for us. Uh, and then we've got to, to manage contracts across the agency. So there are multiple places where uh, we've got to merge contracts in order to provide services. Uh, how do we do commitment-based discounts? Uh, normally we would only procure once a year, somewhere around the end of the fourth quarter when we've got money at the end of the year in order to plan for the next year. So knowing what we're gonna need uh, once a year is kind of challenging. And then our ability to forecast and align the budgets. One of the things that the, the federal budget process operates in what we call a three year cycle, current year and then two years out. And so our ability to forecast what we believe our cloud spending is gonna be is like buying a new house and on day one asking me what my utility bills are gonna be. I, I just don't know. And so trying to figure out how we baseline that such that we can do some accurate reporting uh, and forecasting to Congress and to OMB are going to be some of our challenges. Next slide. And so love to have you join. We've got a federal working group uh, in the Slack channel uh, for anybody that's interested uh, on the federal government or, or state or local government side, because we believe uh, that our framework will be adopted to many government agencies and disciplines. And thank you so much for your time. Melvin, thank you for your continued leadership on this. It's always great to get your updates in the TAC. Um, for those of you who haven't looked at the framework, uh, what Melvin and the team are working on are a great example of what we call a playbook. The framework is not meant to be prescriptive because everybody's gonna do it a little differently, but we're building playbooks that are prescriptive for certain industries, for certain clouds, et cetera. So the government playbook is something that, you know, as Tiago from Brazil was asking in the beginning, could this be applied to Brazilian government? Yeah, you could take that, duplicate it, and, you know, make any changes there. So watch as that develops and, and great to see this move forward. So we're gonna take the last eight minutes to talk about upcoming working groups. We're gonna do lightning pitches of those that you can get involved with. And then we're gonna hear about the latest training offerings. And for those who wanna stick around, we're gonna do breakouts at the very end. So uh, Vaz, you wanna give us a run through and I'm gonna do a 30 second timer on the working group pitches. So working group folks, get ready. Take care, yeah. And so what you'll notice um, uh, very quickly, uh, just to highlight for folks is, we're trying to reorganize our working groups and our special interest groups around sort of the missions of the FinOps Foundation. So as we walk through the working groups and the various uh, special interest groups, not everyone is pitching today, but there are working groups and special interest groups that you are all welcome to join. So uh, right now, while the focus will be on the on the folks that are pitching for 
support in the breakout room. We're happy to talk more about uh, overall working groups and special interest groups uh, in more detail. So with that, our first pillar is building community. This is a listing of all special interest groups that are available for folks to come and join. They're active for contribution and some great conversations happening in there. What's great about special interest groups is a lot of times working groups come out of those. So keep an eye on conversations there. And if there's anything interesting here, please join them. No pitches for this section, JR. The next one is advancing careers of FinOps practitioners. So under this uh, uh, objective for our foundation, JR, if you go to the next one, we have our working group that is dedicated to advancing FinOps careers. Uh, I won't read the slide. This is what the initial sprint of this working group is going to tackle. Um, and if anyone on that working group, either Mike Bradbury no, or- No, hold even, on, Bess, uh, Bess. Yep. Bess, I've, yep. got, I've actually got Daryl from Software One who's on our Perfect. governing board. And he's gonna there explain why, because this is a working group that's unique, that's going to report directly up to the governing board. Um, and Daryl, if you can just give us really quick why this is so important um, that we, we talk about advancing FinOps careers and we focus on this. Of course, thanks everyone. And the time is going. So, why are advancing careers important? Think about everything we've spoken about today, exploding complexity, um, understanding all the new topics coming out, whether it's sustainability, finance, engineering topics. Where do we find talent, whether you're in an end user organization, a service consulting provider, even in the technology platform space, we're seeing a massive need for talent and we're trying to progress and grow that. One second to go. Awesome, thank you. So the first meeting is gonna be February 23rd. At that time, we're gonna take guidance from the governing board to discuss what the first output will be for that meeting. Um, so appreciate that. Thanks a lot, Daryl. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl, that's great. Uh, and then finally, the third pillar in terms of uh, the FinOps Foundation mission is defining cloud financial management standards and best practices. And in this section, we actually have three working groups that we're looking to kick off. Uh, Paulo, if you're on the call and would like to talk to this working group, the intersection of ITFM and TBM with FinOps. Um, Paulo, are you on the call? Is anyone okay. from this working group on the call? Unfortunately, I think Paulo's had some drop. Okay, no worries. So again, I won't read the slide, but if you're interested in joining this working group, the, the proposal is in progress and we expect uh, that this working group will kick off soon. The next working group uh, that is looking to get some support and um, kick off, it's in a proposal state now, is uh, FinOps Open Standards for Cloud Billing Data. Max, are you on the call? Are you able to talk a little bit about uh, this working group? Yes, I'm on the call, thank you. Awesome. Uh, so one of the things we, uh, my name is Maxime, one of the things we are uh, building at Palo Alto is a uh, uh, common language. How do we talk about cost? Uh, do we start with invoice? and get to the public cost? Do we start with invoice and get to the usage driven product level cost? How do we define cost elements, uh, discounts in the code? How do we compare them between uh, AWS and GCP? So that's the work stream. Thanks, Max. And the next one, JR, is also a good friend, Max. It's not the same Max, a different Max, but what a coincidence. So uh, some interest around the intersection of FinOps for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, Max, can you chat a little bit about uh, this working group and uh, what you see happening here? You might be on mute. Um, All right, well, we got three minutes. So I'm, that one is there, uh, yep. check it out in Slack. I'm gonna move us to the last bit, which is education before we hit breakouts. Thank you, Vaz and everybody for your pitches. Cheers. All right. Hey, this, is, this is me. Guys, can I just, first of all, I just wanna say, I like a, a year ago, JR and I were here just like managing all this. And now we have this whole amazing team working with us and there's a community that has grown leaps and bounds. And it's so exciting. And it's evident within our education as well. If you look back in 2019, we first started out with just a practitioner training. And now what you have is this lovely diagram of how we see the training fitting together. We have these uh, FinOps adjacent persona-based training, which we started building at the, uh, the beginning of last year with the FinOps for engineers, and we'll build out additional FinOps persona-based training. We have underneath that kind of that practitioner training. And then finally, the one that's being released 
or is released this year is at FinOps Professional Training. And if you think about it, FinOps certified professionals are just at the center of any of the corporate FinOps practices that are working with the team of practitioners, and then they're supporting the other personas throughout the organization. So we get asked a lot, like, where should you sit or where should, what type of training you should take? And this is really a great diagram of kind of let you know, you know, our roadmap, how we're thinking about training, and also what training and certification you should look to get. Um, JR, if you want to go to the next slide. And we're really excited to say that now we're offering this training on a very brand new training platform. Um, our old training platform is going to be deprecated tomorrow. I thought you were going to say the old training platform sucked, but yes. It did. The new one is and much I'm better. I'm tell you why. Because so I built it. <laughs> it, it no, it ha actually, that's not why it sucked, JR, at all. The, the reason it was difficult in the past is because for any of you that took training, you know you had to register in one site, access the course content in another site, and then take the exam in a third location. Now we're doing it like it should be. Everything is in one space, register, access course content, and take the exams all in one place. place. It's easily easy to track the progress through your modules. So if you, you know, start a video and have to stop, you can start where um, you left off. And also you can instantly share certifications from LinkedIn. So as soon as you earn that um, certification, you can post it onto LinkedIn and it's a verifiable link. So folks can just, you know, verify that you are that person that got trained. So really excited about that. If you have questions, you know how to get a hold of us. Sorry, I wasn't rushing. I thought we had more slides. No, but I thought you are... wanted to tell me to exhale because I did just talk really fast. <laughs> <laughs> we are at time. Uh, we'll leave this this slide up here, which is upcoming events. Uh, there's a lot lot starting to happen. Um, there is looking to actually be we be one of the first in person meetups in London on the 28th if uh, regulations and all the things allow. Uh, so look to get involved with some of these. Um, and we're going to leave the breakouts uh, here for the next uh, as long as people can stick around. Uh, anybody who wants to dig into uh, the state of FinOps can stay in this main room, and we're going to break out uh, a couple additional rooms, which are a how to get involved with working groups in TAC with VAS and how to get involved with the work government. Uh, I'm not sure if Mel will stick around, but uh, Rob and Co. will be there. Uh, and with that, you should see break up, break out, <laughs> break up, breakout rooms popping yeah. up here. Yeah, I'll go ahead and open the breakout room. So folks, this time around, you have the power to go to whatever room you want. I'm not pre-assigning you to a room. You do need to have the actual um, Slack app open to do that, not Slack, but excuse me, Zoom app open to do that. If you can't move to a room and you need help, please drop me a chat and I will try to move you to that room, but I will go ahead and open all the rooms right now. And Reminder on the code of conduct, be nice, be kind, be inclusive, don't sales pitch. We do boot people from these uh, for violating these items and we have and we continue to. So please, please be a good citizen and don't share confidential information like pricing or private negotiations or anything like that. JR, uh, yes. may I ask you a question? Uh, do you have any plan on uh, uh, taking part on KubeCon as a co-located event uh, on the, you know, uh, next yeah. year or something great, like this? Great question. So we, we are planning, again, all things allowing to be um, sponsoring KubeCon Valencia in May. Is it May? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're currently going to have a booth. We're looking at doing some meetups around it. We're not looking at a full co-located event because we're not sure how many of the Europeans are going to be able to travel to Spain, uh, but we're open to it. So yeah, if, if you want to get involved or, or if a bunch of you say, yeah, I want to go to Valencia in May, we could do a co-located event. I'll be there. Awesome. You're coming from Brazil? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm coming from Brazil. Love it. I'm a uh, program committee member for the AI Day. So I have to be there. Excellent. All right. If you are asking to get put into a room, folks, just give me, be patient with me. I do have to scroll through everybody in the participants list to find you. So I'll see them and I'll get you there as soon as I can. But remember, this is the main room where you can talk about um, what is this room? <laughs> I forgot what this room is. We're, we're going we're gonna to jump back into the state of FinOps data Perfect. here. Yes, yep. there we go. And then we have a room on working groups and TAC, how to get involved and then on uh, the government working group, so. Before we jump into State of FinOps, can we check out Renata's drawing? Oh yes, excellent call. So if those of you have been following along, here comes Renata's drawing. Thanks for the reminder there. Boom. Renata, that's gorgeous. That is beautiful. It's a good thing that's I was awesome. on mute when you flipped over because that was a loud whoa. <laughs> I kind of want to print that on A1 and like have it on a wall. That's awesome. 
Fantastic. We're looking forward to bringing you back to more of these. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording since we're at the end of the formal session. Uh, folks can go to the breakouts. Thank you, everybody, for joining. We're going to hang out here for about another 30 minutes to chat state of FinOps and those other topics. And looking forward to seeing you in the community.